Hawking proposed it in 1976. So I'm guessing a lot of people in this talk were not born in 1976, but that is when Hawking first formulated the paradox. And the paradox arises as soon as you have a general relativistic formulation of a black hole and then start to seriously consider the quantum matter fields. It's an open problem. It's been in existence for a long time. And in the little diagram at the bottom, I have the progression in our understanding of gravity itself. And you'll see it's in stage three when we start to think about quantum fields in curved space time, i.e. say uh, photon excitations propagating in a black hole background. Um, that's where Hawking did his initial calculations that we start to see a problem. But to resolve the problem, you have to go a little bit further. You have to actually consider the quantum states of the graviton fields. And that's what I'll be mainly focused on in this talk. But I want to emphasize nothing in this talk is speculative. Everything is using known physics. We are not invoking any new physics to resolve the paradox. We are just exploring in more sort of careful detail, uh, under, well understood physics concerned with uh, quantum gravity. So we don't require a full theory of quantum geometry to make progress here. Okay, uh, has the slide advanced? No. Yeah, now it did. Great, okay. Um, this slide is describing something which is probably familiar to everyone, uh, the Schwarzschild solution. So that was the first black hole solution discovered really quite a long ago, over a century ago. It has a very simple form. The metric is written there. And it has some interesting features. For example, it has a horizon at r equals 2m. Throughout this talk, uh, except in one or two places, I will use natural units. So I'll use units where Newton's constant, the Planck length, h bar and c are all equal to one. And so if you look carefully at the Schwarzschild solution, you'll see that there is a horizon. That horizon is at r equals 2m. And the horizon is really in a sense defined by the effects it has on causality in this space time. And I'm gonna focus on that a little bit uh, for the next few slides because it's very uh, central to the formulation of the information paradox. Now, where were we? So we had introduced the Schwarzschild metric as a simple example of a black hole space time. Now, in classical general relativity, there are results called no hair theorems. And what they tell you is that only certain properties of the black hole are manifested in the external metric, external behavior of the space-time around the black hole. And the properties of the black hole that can be discerned through the properties of these classical solutions are things like its mass, its angular momentum, the various charges, uh, if, if, if the charges correspond to continuous symmetries, gauge symmetries, um, then they're reflected in the hair that the black hole has. And in the first part of this talk, what I'll discuss is uh, what happens when you take into account quantum gravitational effects and how they generate a kind of hair which violates uh, these no hair theorems. So information about what's inside the black hole is actually reflected in the quantum state of the gravitational field. And we call that quantum hair. So it's the quantum uh, counterpart to classical hair and it violates the classical no hair theorems. Okay, on this slide, uh, I have a picture of the causality of the black hole spacetime. And so as we all know, this forward light cone defines the set of points in spacetime which can be affected by the point at the uh, apex of the cone. And the main feature of a black hole spacetime is that the light cone itself tips over when you cross the horizon. So if you look at those little green uh, light cones on the right, you can see that uh, if, an, if the point that you're looking at is inside the horizon, which is, which is described by this sort of uh, pinkish cylinder, the moment you cross the cylinder, the entire forward light cone is inside and remains inside the cylinder. And what that means is every uh, observer that reaches the inside uh, region of that cylinder or inside the horizon their future includes a singularity. No matter how they fire their rocket engines or navigate around, they will in the end hit the singularity. And so there's a, 
there's a there's a disconnect causally between the interior of the black hole and the exterior of the black hole. Now, in order to uh, in in order to enable clear thinking about the causal structure of space time, Penrose invented a set of diagrams, a, a way of visualizing uh, these space times. And so this is an example of a Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. So this is a black hole in which uh, you start with a star, the star collapses, uh, it eventually becomes dense enough that it causes the creation of a horizon. And the horizon is uh, described by this triangle. I don't know if you can see my pointer on the screen here. You can see your pointer, yes. Great. So this upper triangle is the interior of the black hole. The boundary of at, which is at these 45 degree angles of this region is itself the horizon. And on the uh, diagram, light rays propagate at 45 degree angles. So if you start in the distance, distant past, so you could call it past null infinity, light rays which come in, for example, and hit the star will travel as, I, as I'm moving the uh, pointer. Um, light rays that are heading into the future, for example, emitted by the star, will travel this way, and they'll reach future null infinity. And uh, the mystery place is this singularity where, uh, for example, in classical general relativity, you, you reach infinite density, energy density. No one really knows what happens here. We don't uh, have a theory of what's happening here. That requires a full-blown theory of quantum gravity. Um, and the problem is that some degrees of freedom can go behind the horizon where they become causally disconnected from the rest of the universe and then they eventually vanish when they hit the singularity. So this is an example of the Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. Now, at this point, uh, I believe Hawking, I believe these Penrose diagrams were invented before Hawking radiation was uh, discovered. So I think I'm following actually roughly the historical timeline here. Um, Hawking asked the question, let's allow some matter degrees of freedom, for example, the photon or an electron, to fluctuate in the background of this uh, black hole spacetime, say Schwarzschild spacetime. And you, even though the description I'm about to give is very cartoon-like, it does really capture the actual physics of Hawking radiation. So imagine you have an electron positron or matter antimatter vacuum fluctuation so those vacuum fluctuations are happening everywhere in space time at all times and um, so imagine you fluctuate so that you have a particle and an antiparticle and it just so happens that that fluctuation happens close to the horizon so one of the pair ends up falling in to the uh, past the horizon so it ends up in the singularity but then the other uh, part of the fluctuation doesn't pass the horizon and it's able to make it out to uh, positive null infinity, future null infinity. So that is actually the, at a really fundamental level, the quantum process that leads to Hawking radiation. You constantly have fluctuations near the horizon. Some of the energy and information can escape, but also some of the information and energy are, end up behind the horizon and they end up, it ends up causally disconnected from the rest of the universe. Now, a few facts about uh, Hawking radiation and black holes. The temperature of the black hole is proportional to one over its radius in Planck units, which is also proportional to one over its mass. So black holes have extremely low temperatures and this Hawking radiation process is extremely slow. And black holes have lifetimes proportional to m cubed, which uh, can easily be, for a macroscopic black hole, can easily be longer than the age of the universe. So in a way, this is a problem people did not get very concerned about because they thought, well, this is a very hypothetical problem because we'll never see any black holes evaporate. And so what if some information is destroyed in the process of black hole evaporation? So now post Hawking's formulation of the paradox, uh, it's useful to look at this version of a Penrose diagram which describes not an eternal black hole, but a black hole which is actually evaporating and which eventually ceases to exist. So let me start by uh, looking at this uh, dotted line, which is labeled world line of an external observer. So uh, in these diagrams, space-like slices are generally uh, sort of horizontal. They connect this line out to one of these boundaries here. 
And so if you think of a particular slicing or particular coordinate system uh, uh, of this space time, um, you can think of time as progressing forward uh, as I move my uh, pointer up along this dotted line. So at point A, the observer can see a star and this, this black line can, could be, for example, a choice of uh, a space like slice. Uh, it, and on the space like slice, the points on this black line are meant to be simultaneous in that coordinate system. So uh, if observer A looks over at the star, he sees a star that has not yet collapsed to a black hole, um, but it maybe is in the process of collapsing to a black hole. As that observer moves forward in time, there will be a later point in his timeline in which he sees that a black hole is formed. He sees a horizon and he sees Hawking radiation being radiated uh, away from the black hole that will eventually reach future null infinity. So point B is an observer looking at a black hole that has formed and looking at the Hawking radiation that goes to infinity. And point C, which is then in the future of point B, is a point after which the black hole has entirely evaporated. So now observer C, if you, if you make a space like slice for him, uh, which could represent his moment in time, um, he does not see a black hole. The black hole has shrunk to zero radius and disappeared. Um, and from his perspective, um, the black hole formation and then evaporation was just some kind of uh, temporary event. You could, he, from his perspective, he could think of the black hole as some kind of metastable state that was created. It existed for a little while, but then it slowly leaked radiation. Eventually, it's gone. Okay. So um, this is a Penrose diagram of an, an evaporating black hole. Now you can already start to see the the how the paradox is formulated here because this Hawking radiation is originating outside the horizon. In that cartoon diagram I showed you, you have a little fluctuation of a particle antiparticle pair, and one of the pair enters into the horizon, the other one goes off to infinity. But the point of origination of this radiation is outside the horizon, so it's causally disconnected from all the stuff that uh, has already fallen into the hole. And so what Hawking said in 1976 was that uh, the very existence of black holes um, necessitates a violation of unitarity. And in particular, if, if you're used to this language from quantum information theory or from foundations of quantum mechanics, black holes themselves can cause pure states to evolve into mixed states. So if you start the universe off in a pure state, the evolution which forms a black hole, which then later evaporates, leads to a mixed state uh, in the far future of the universe. And this is a very fundamental problem because pure states are not supposed to evolve into mixed states when you take the, the whole universe uh, into account. So that was quite a celebrated paradox, which people have been thinking about now for well over 40 years. And um, let me discuss a, a modern formulation of it. Again, I've repeated the same diagram here these blue lines are space, space like slices, so you can think of them as moments uh, in, in a time like evolution. And um, in a modern formulation, uh, this is circa, this was first formulated maybe circa 1990s or so. Um, it was useful to select certain slices in this foliation of the space time and to choose one as a so called nice slice. And the nice slice would have the following property that it would intersect most of the radiation generated by the black hole, but it would also intersect all of the matter that fell into the black hole. And because by the 90s, there was more information, there was more in interest in quantum information theory, uh, people were aware of something called the no cloning theorem. The no cloning theorem, which is a just a simple result in basic quantum mechanics, says that information, quantum information cannot be present in two space like separated regions at the same time. And so for the information to have fallen into the black hole, but also to be encoded somehow in the Hawking radiation, which is escapes, would be a violation of the no cloning theorem applied to the quantum state on that nice slice. So that, that's a kind of uh, modern formulation uh, of the paradox, uh, which originated, I think, around the 1990s. Okay. So what is what are the weaknesses of these formulations? So you'll notice everything I've done so far um, is in the, in that evolution of theories from Newtonian gravity to general relativity to quantum fields, 
propagating in a fixed background space time to a full blown theory of quantum geometry. All of these formulations live in level three of that diagram. They still require a fixed classical background geometry. And then they ask questions about individual quantum fluctuations, typically of matter fields in that background geometry. Now, you could go a little further and you could consider fluctuations of a spin two degree of freedom, which is the graviton in the background geometry, but that doesn't actually change the, the, the Hawking information paradox at all. What you really need to do to go further is to actually ask about the quantum state of the geometry itself, the quantum state of the background space time. And uh, this quantum hair, these quantum hair results, which I'm about to give now, uh, establish that the quantum state of the graviton field outside the horizon depends explicitly on the internal state of the black hole. There is in fact a link, despite the fact that in classical physics, there is a very uh, explicit, uh, one can divide the space-time into causal regions. Once you consider a full quantum treatment of the space-time itself, i.e. you treat, you, you ask about the quantum state of the graviton field, outside the black hole, you see that it is actually not true that uh, there is no causal link between the internal state of the black hole and what is happening outside with the gravitational field. Okay, so let me summarize the results of the first preprint. Uh, I think I have the right one there. It's the first preprint. Maybe I have the wrong number actually. So it, I think this should be 2110, not 2112, if I'm not mistaken. So I might have the wrong link there, but it's the, it's the first paper uh, that we wrote. And so let me just summarize the results and I'll go into it in more detail. So the first result is that if you ask about the asymptotic quantum state of the graviton field of a compact object, which is an energy eigenstate. So I, I wanna be very specific about the quantum state of the source, the, it's a compact object and it's an energy eigenstate. And then ask questions about the quantum state of the long range gravitational field, you can show that that long, the quantum state of that long range gravitational field is determined at leading order by the energy eigenvalue of the compact source. And this implies that if there are no accidental energy degeneracies of this comp compact matter source, then there is actually a one to one map between individual graviton states that are sourced by this compact uh, matter configuration and the internal states of the matter configuration itself. And furthermore, you can show that therefore a semi-classical matter source produces an entangled graviton state. And I'll go into these uh, results in more detail. Now, the second thing that's concluded in this paper is a particular example of a calculation in which we look at, we allow quantum gravitational fluctuations, i.e. we allow propagating gravitons to appear in loops. And we show that this produces corrections to the long range potential and there corrections of order one over R to the five. So instead of a one over R to the potential, this is obviously a much weaker effect because it's due to quantum effects, but uh, it is there. And in fact, the coefficient of the one over R to the fifth term is itself dependent on the internal state of the source. So if we try different sources like a dust ball with this configuration and a dust ball with another configuration of energy density, we find different coefficients of the one over R to the fifth term. So this is an explicit example of how when you treat the gravitational field quantum mechanically, um, you can uh, produce a different quantum state. So there, there is a quantum state corresponding to this classical potential that's produced, a uh, quantum state of a graviton field. You get a different quantum state depending on the internal configuration uh, of the source. And so therefore it would encode some information about the internal state of the black hole.